Yeah, so despite what the clock says, it's 11 past, so we should start. Uh, so I'm very happy to welcome, while she's been here today, to uh, Murray Clay from UCSB, who's done a lot of really good work in dynamics and other things related to planets. Uh, Ruth Brown, PhD at Berkeley. Uh, I guess you were an undergrad at Harvard. Sure. PhD at Berkeley, then you went back to, to Harvard, right? And she was an SAO. Scientist. Federal scientist, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then um, moved to UCSB a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. So, bouncing between the coasts. Yeah. Anyway, so today she's going to talk about the origin, tell us about the origin of structure and planetary systems. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here. I'm going to talk about planetary systems, and I'll start. Um, with a question that you know, is often discussed, especially in the media, and that is, is Earth rare? Right. So there are many things that I could mean by this. I could wonder if there are aliens out there shooting each other with phasers, and honestly, I'd really like to know. <laughs> but of course, um, we'd like to stay a little bit more uh, grounded in the data. So, um, so what I'd like to ask instead is the question, is the solar system rare? And it's not the only way of thinking about this, but one way uh, of thinking about this question is to ask which stars are likely to host planets similar to Earth. So I'm just, I'm generally interested in the astrophysics of formation of planetary systems. So this isn't, uh, this isn't necessarily my day-to-day -day motivation, but I'm going to come back to this um, as we go through this discussion at the end. All right. So as you know, one of the earliest um, major results in the field of exoplanets observationally was the finding that radial velocity detected planets um, are much more frequent around high metallicity stars, right? So if you look at a star that has um, one of these higher metallicities on the right here, uh, the percentage of stars that host planets goes up dramatically. This is back uh, a decade ago from Fisher and Valenti. So looking at this, you might think, should we start, um, should we search for Earth analogs around high metallicity stars? And since I'm asking the question, you'll probably guess I'm going to answer no, and we'll get to that um, later on. Okay, so I said, our solar system's rare, so what do I mean by a solar system? So here's my diagram of the solar system. On here, um, the orbits, the orbital distances are to scale. The planet sizes, of course, are not to scale, so in here we have the rocky planets, then we have Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Because I'm a theorist, we have four Earths, two Jupiters, and two Neptunes in our system. And of course, it's not just because I'm a theorist, it's also because this is the state of the data that we have now. You know, and out in the outer um, regions, we have the Kuiper belt and, and in here, the asteroid belt. So if we look at um, a planetary system structure like this, we'd like to know um, is this environment that the Earth um, has formed and evolved within a common one in the universe? So, of course, we have a lot of data now. We, can't, we still can't answer this question, but we can say a number of things. If we look in planetary systems um, out to this sort of distance from their star, Kepler has found you know, thousands of high-quality planets and planet candidates. Here's um, a plot of some of those results from 2012. Um, here's periods, so distance from the star. Uh, here's size, here's Earth's, Neptune's, and Jupiter's in terms of sizes. Of course, uh, Kepler didn't quite get out to the distance and size of Earth, but one of its major results is that small planets, uh, which are presumably largely rocky planets, are extremely common in the universe, found around almost every star in the sky. All right, so then if we go out to larger separations, you know, out here, um, radial velocity surveys have, of course, also found many planets. So again, now here we have semi-major axis, also distance versus mass of the planet, Jupiter, Neptunes, and Earths. Uh, Earths are, are even harder to see um, in the radial velocity data. Now you can see many giants. And we'll come back to this, this particular plot um, a number of uh, times later in the talk. But Jupiter is somewhere out here at the edge of, of sensitivity. So one of the other early results from exoplanet observations is, of course, that many of these giant planets found with the radial velocity surveys have very high eccentricities. So here we have distance um, versus eccentricity. Here are the giant planets in our solar system for reference, and these are uh, on very close to circular orbits. And many of the giant planets found by radial velocities um, are not. And most recently, uh, direct imaging has found giant planets um, at very wide separation. So this is the HR8799 system. Um, this is Neptune's orbital distance for scale. And on here we have four uh, 
probably approximately 10 Jupiter mass planets at very wide separations. So um, I'll come back to this system later as well. So, so what can we uh, infer from this about the solar system's architecture? Well, the first thing that we can say immediately is that it's not typical. Something like 30% of stars in the sky have super Earths on uh, short separation orbits. We know this from Kepler. Those are not found in the solar system. Um, there are plenty of high eccentricity giant planets from the radial velocity data. So it's clearly the case that the solar system's architecture isn't typical, but we still don't know if it's uh, a common um, outcome of planet formation. All right, so how can we get at this? Uh, let's take a step back and uh, recall how planetary systems form. So of course, they start in star forming regions like this one, uh, Orion, in this classic HST image. And here you can see in all of these squares, uh, young stars with disks forming around them. These disks uh, come from collapse of the cloud during the star formation process. So if we take this simpler system, you have a dark cloud here um, from all this at all. And you can see around the edges that this image has well, maybe you can't in this light, but uh, has reddened stars. So you can see uh, reddening through the dust in the outer regions, and they were actually able to use that reddening to measure the density distribution of this cloud well enough to see that it's marginally unstable to collapse. So if it collapses under its own self-gravity, you always have a little bit of rotation. You have rotation, um, you have centrifugal support in the, in the plane, you can collapse easily along the poles, and as often the case in astrophysics, you end up with a disk. Right? So you have a star, Here's your disk. It's being fed by uh, collapsing material from the cloud. In the outer regions, you have gas, dust, and ice. And in the inner regions where it's hot, you just have gas and dust. All right, so, so what can you do with this? Well, before the, um, before the discovery of exoplanets, of course, we had a very good idea of how planetary systems formed. It all fit together very nicely. And it was, uh, and it, you know, basically relied on these two fundamental principles, right? So if you have your disk, uh, you have some solid material in the disk. Um, it collides with itself, it grows. If you have more material, it grows faster. Um, and it also, uh, if, it's, if the time scale for your orbit is, uh, is, if the orbit is faster, then the growth is faster. So long growth time scales um, go with long orbital periods. Right, so if you go ahead and you take um, our solar system, you can explain its architecture very well using these two principles, right? So you have rocky planets in the interior. That's where the disk um, had very little material. So you only make puny things like Earth. Right, you go out farther in distance, um, it gets colder, so you can start having ices as well as uh, rocky solids. You also just have a larger area here in this disk to work with, so you have more material. Um, both of those things allow you to grow larger solids. And if you can grow um, a rocky core that can get to be up to something like 10 Earth masses, and that, really, that, depend, that exact number depends on a lot of things, um, then it can start accreting a gas envelope that's comparable in mass to itself. So once you have uh, a mass that's twice yours, then you can accrete another mass comparable to yourself. And this process exponentially runs away, and you end up with a gas giant planet. You know, go out even farther in distance. Now your orbital time is much longer. That means your growth time scale is longer. And then if you grow your massive, in, in Neptune's case, 15 Earth mass core of solid material, then maybe you don't have as much gas around um, as the disk is, is disappearing um, in order to create a giant planet. All right, so this worked, of course, very well until we found exoplanets and realized that none of them looked like this at all. So the idea now is to understand you know, how much of this is, is right, how much of it needs modification because planets move after they form, and how much of this needs to be rethought. So in order to do that, um, we need to understand you know, how different physical environments lead to different planetary systems, and that will allow us to place our system in context. Right? So you have all of these pieces of this puzzle. You start in an interstellar environment that sets the initial conditions for um, the growth of planetesimals and planets in a disk. They migrate, they dynamically interact and evolve, and you're forming your planets and evolving their atmospheres as you do this. Um, so today, well, it's not the only thing that I'm going to talk about, but the organizing principle that I'm going to use today is to ask, under what circumstances does giant planet formation um, 
in this context produce Earth, uh, permit Earth-like histories for terrestrial planets. All right, so to answer that, we need to start with understanding how giant planets form. And um, right now, at least, the place that I'm most interested in thinking about this is in these wide separation systems um, that have been found through direct imaging. So this one is, and in particular this one, H8799, which if you take any of the classic theories of planet formation, shouldn't exist. So that's what's nice about it. Um, it makes all of the theories break, and that, uh, that provides an opportunity. So again, here are these four uh, approximately 10 Jupiter mass planets um, orbiting uh, at approximately Neptune's orbital distance and even farther around an A star. And the question, um, when you look at this system immediately, is are these best, best thought of as, as big planets, or are they really best thought of as small stars? This is a very rare system. We know that these are not common in the universe. But, um, but I'd like to know where did they come from. Right, so here we have three ways that we could standardly think of to form companions to stars. They could form by turbulent fragmentation. Uh, that's how we think multiple stellar systems form. Right, so you just have you know, different regions of your cloud happen to collapse close enough to each other to be bound. Um, you could have a, a gravitational instability in a disk around a young star that collapses directly into a companion. Or you can have what, oh yeah, this isn't working, I'm just using my fingers. Um, or you can have what we were, uh, were talking about earlier. You can have core accretion. So you have solid material, it collides, it grows from dust all the way up to something very large, approximately the size of Neptune or a little smaller, and that allows you to accrete a massive envelope. All right, so for this system, I think that we can just cross off turbulent fragmentation without further thought, because when you look at stellar multiple systems, they usually look hierarchical. They look something like this. You'll have two stars orbiting each other and another one at a very large distance. And H8799 instead looks like a, a primary mass in the center with um, smaller objects on uh, concentric orbits. So the architecture just doesn't look right. All right, so we can go back to these two additional mechanisms, gravitational instability or core accretion. And um, this one, you know, is, it's an old idea. It's been around for a long time um, that was out of favor for a very long time for good reason. And that is because when you try to do this, um, it generates really massive things at very wide separations. But of course, that's what the H8799 system looks like. So it's worth uh, taking a look at this again. All right, so the way I like to think about this is to look at this on this observational plot. This is a plot that has the most systematics you have ever seen in your entire life. So there's in no way is this complete. So here's separation, here's mass ratio. This is for scale, this is the size that we think of as planets, brown dwarfs, and stars. And on here we have um, known planetary companions. These are mostly from RV, or I think these are all from RV. And up here we have brown dwarf companions. And if you put, um, if you look out here, this is larger than most observed protoplanetary disks. So we really think that these things are not planets that formed in a disk for the most part. And if you put H8799 on the system, it sits right in the middle. So it's really not clear, just looking at this, whether this should be part of the brown dwarf population or part of the planet population. All right. So let's. Uh, talk about a few of these origin stories. So we'll talk about, so they could be gravitational instability, core accretion. Um, you could just say, well, these form closer to the star and scattered outward. This probably happens, in fact, it probably happens all the time. But for this system, I think this is hard. You have to get four of them. They're actually dynamically very well packed. Um, I don't think you're gonna do it for this one, even though you may be able to for others. In fact, if you don't see this sort of thing in many systems, then we have a problem. And you could, you could imagine more complicated scenarios, but for the moment, um, I'm just going to look at these. Okay, so I'm going to cross this one off and start by looking at gravitational instability. All right, so of course gravitational instability happens when self-gravity overcomes pressure and tidal gravity. So if you take a disk and you imagine um, some scale on the disk, uh, then you ask what is, then at small scales, pressure will support collapse against gravity. At very large scales, tidal gravity or shear will cause things to shear apart and prevent collapse. And uh, the question is, does there exist an intermediate scale where collapse is allowed? And the first scale where that can happen 
is the scale height of the disk. And that's perhaps um, not that surprising, because if you think of at the scale height of the disk, that's where the vertical component of gravity, which looks just like that tidal gravity term, balances vertical pressure. So this is the most unstable scale. And what this tells you is you can actually get um, at least approximately a minimum fragment mass, which goes something like the surface density times the scale height squared times some coefficient that, um, that you have to get from simulations. So we did this for this system. And um, what you get is that if here's distance from the star and here's mass, these are the fragment masses that, um, actually these are the observed planet masses and these are the fragment masses that, uh, that we calculated. There's a minimum distance um, that you can do this at because closer to that you can't actually cool fast enough to proceed with collapse. So if you look at this plot, you can see, well, maybe it's okay. Maybe you can make these things through fragmentation. But you need to do two things. The first one is they can't grow any faster. They can't grow anymore after they fragmented. And then they have to migrate in a little bit. So let's think about the second one. Maybe they did migrate in a little bit. That's OK. In fact, when the system first came out, Dan Fabricki and I noticed that um, you know, the, the quoted uh, orbital parameters caused the system to go unstable extremely quickly um, and fall apart. And if you need, um, so in order to keep this system around for anything close to its current age, you need to put these planets in mutual, mutual mean motion resonances. And that's a generic uh, signature of convergent migration. So perhaps they migrated toward each other in the disk. OK, what about the second part? What about not growing? Well, that could happen too, but you have to tell a very specific story. And the idea that, that, um, that we presented here is that collapse has to occur at the end of infall, or the fragment will grow to a binary star. So the idea here is you're putting material onto your disk. It's accreting onto the star. If it collapses and forms a fragment, and then infall continues, the disk will grow at distances <coughs> larger than the planet. So what's this material going to do? It's not going to hop over the planet onto the star. It's going to accrete on the planet, and it's going to make it grow. So the thing will grow, and out of these distances, the isolation mass here is stellar. So you'd expect to grow to a brown dwarf or even a low mass star. OK, so here's the gravitational instability story. You start with a star, I mean, start with a cloud. It you know, produces a young star, the disk, the disk grows, then you fragment into four fragments, and then they open a gap, and then you stop immediately, and then they migrate, and then it dissipates, and hooray. Uh, okay, so it works, but this is very fine-tuned, right? You have to very t tell this very specific story to make it work. And um, the point of this is that uh, you would expect that typically you would produce higher mass companions from disk collapse. So you should be able to go to this population and see um, this region of this plot being filled in. Is the fact that there are similar masses in any rest of the Would you expect there to be more of a variance in the mass? Um, from fragmentation, I mean, it's not clear. I mean, the, actually, when, you, when people do simulations of fragmentation, then often it happens in spiral arms that are in the, dis in, you know, the variations at the level of this, I don't think that you can necessarily draw a conclusion. OK. So anyway, you should expect to see these things um, here. So the word on the street from the direct imaging uh, community, because they can see these things, is that they're not there. Um, the, the complete statistics have not been done. And I'm excited to see that happening with surveys that are happening right now. So I'm willing to, to keep an open mind about this. But that is the word on the street, that they're not there. Like From GPI and uh, Sphere and people who are, um, you know, and people who are doing other smaller projects. Yeah. So, uh, but the full analysis hasn't been done. OK, so, so let's assume they're right for a moment. And these can't be coming from gravitational instability. So what about core accretion? Well, the problem with core accretion is that these things are so far out that you'd expect the time scales for growth to be way too long. All right. So, um, so if the time scales for growth are way too long, then you can't make them by core accretion before the disk dissipates in a few million years. OK. So, so this is this, right? So if you're growing a massive solid core through collisions, you have this longstanding problem of the less doubling time. But, and what I'm about to argue is that actually, if you can increase the, the cross-section for accretion, then, then you can actually get around this. 
Okay. Right. So what are the cross sections for the collision process that, that allows core growth? Well, of course, if you have things moving fast past a core, you have some physical cross section. If they're moving more slowly, you get gravitational focusing. If you get captured by gas drag into a planetary atmosphere, then you can increase your, your uh, cross section. But none of these are enough. You still have too slow growth. But what you can do is make gas useful and um, use the gas in the disk to actually capture planetesimals into orbit around the core and then have their orbits decay into the center. And this is actually very analogous um, for those of you who are familiar with it, with ideas about binary formation in the Kuiper belt through dissipation with a small uh, sea of planetesimals in the region. So the idea is you come in, you dissipate your relative kinetic energy, you get captured into orbit, and you, uh, and you accrete onto the core. All right, so if you have no gas, right, satellites can orbit your core within a hill radius. This is the radius where tidal gravity pulling out um, away from the core is balanced by the core's self-gravity. And that's where you can have, for example, the moon orbiting around the Earth. It has to be within the hill radius. In the presence of gas, um, then there's an additional force, and that's coming from gas drag. Right? So on a large body, gas drag is small because you have a, a, a small surface area to mass ratio. Your acceleration is large on a smaller thing because you have a large surface area to mass ratio. So this is size dependent. So depending on the size of your satellite that's trying to orbit um, your core, if its acceleration by gas drag is much larger than the acceleration at the core, it can just be pulled away because of gas drag. So this gives you a different stability radius, which we call the whoosh radius. And inside of there, you can, you can orbit uh, your core still. So if you imagine a core and a planetesimal trying to orbit each other in gas, they could either be sheared apart, as we said. And if they're not, they could inspiral and merge. Right, so how, does you, how do you get it into orbit? Well, as I said before, you can get this into orbit um, through binary capture. So you bring in your planetesimal into your wish radius. Uh, if you can dissipate that relative kinetic energy, you can capture it into orbit. Uh, do that dissipation and, and increase your cross section. So this has been uh, called pebble accretion. It's been worked on by Ormel and Klar and Lambrex and Johansson. And this can actually increase the cross section for accretion um, up to the hill radius. Here's an example, um, in this case, of a, of a smooth disk uh, where accretion goes out to the hill radius. And out of these large distances, that actually increases your uh, accretion cross section by, a f well, your, your distance by a factor of 100, and then you get to square it. So you get a cross section accretion increase by of uh, a factor of 10 to the 4, which is sort of. So these are masses where you're not opening a gap in the disk. So these are masses where you're not opening a gap in the disk. These are cores. So once you're, um, that's right. So these things, so these, uh, so this is very sensitive to the sizes of the accreted objects because it's gas drag. And I'll, I'll show you, um, for example, the, and it tends to be small things that are most efficient. So if, uh, for example, you take 50% of your minimum mass nebula in sizes from millimeters to 10 centimeters, which are the things that are easy to make. You don't have to worry about the meter size barrier. That's one of the big problems in planet formation. Then you can get something that starts at a Pluto mass out at 70 AU to grow up to become a, a critical core, and actually just a few times 10 to the five years, which is much less than the lifetime of the disk. So again, these, these sizes are they're small. That's why this has been called pebble accretion. Yeah, but the existing treatments are inconsistent because the capture speed of the small object by the large object is all about the fragmentation. So, so these things um, are, so when you, when you try to grow these things, their relative velocities uh, can stay below the fragmentation yes. speed. When they, become, when they go into the hill radius, they're not colliding with anything. They're just well, now in the... Be careful because you want to build up enough mass by the equations between them and become important. That's true. But again, depending on your size, they can actually spiral into the core very quickly. So what you're saying is, is relevant, but it's a size-dependent issue. And some of them, um, and for certain sizes, they'll actually just spiral in and be accreted by the primary core very quickly. So it's certainly true that they will be um, 
that if you that the velocities will be large compared to the fragmentation velocity when you're in the Hill radius. Um, it is um, also true that if you're a small enough core, then you can actually be pulled around. I mean, small enough particle, you can be pulled around the core and away by the gas. So you can. There are going to be situations where fragmentation will then allow your material to be lost again because it's. Uh, the main concern is that they break down into very small pieces and they recouple to the gas. That's exactly what I'm talking about. If they get re if, they, if they're recoupled to the gas. Um, too well, and the gas is flowing past the core, then they can be pulled away. But, um, but, it, but if you look at all of the sizes, particularly for, so when you go below Pluto masses, these issues become extremely important because you're, si you're very size dependent, what you can accrete. Once you're up here, you know, at an Earth mass, then it's independent of, it, 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 it does not depend on a lot. There's a huge range of particle sizes that you can accrete. So I, would, I expect that issues like what you bring up are going to be important between Pluto and Earth masses. And also, the turbulent velocity in your disk is also going to be important between Pluto and Earth masses. And so there's going to be, so whether you actually, in any given disk, get this to work in that range is going to matter a lot. But once you get up above an Earth mass where the last doubling time is an issue, then it really doesn't depend on much at all. I mean, there's a huge range of sizes that yeah, the issue is if you take one of these, say, centimeter size things. Right. And then break it down into micron size things. Right. right. Uh, but that requires problem. many collisions. What I'm saying is that there's a huge size range, so you would need to have many collisions to break it down to an extremely small size to be decoupled. Not if it's colliding at uh, 100 times the fragmentation speed. Well, again, the, the range of sizes in here okay. is really large. So I'm not saying that it's not worth thinking about. I'm just saying that my expectation is that what, things like what you're talking about are going to matter a lot down here. And they're going to, it's going to be less sensitive to that up here at the last doubling. So you know, again, these, this, this, this is really short. You have to ask, so why don't we have a 10 Jupiter mass thing at 70 AU? And um, because this is embarrassingly good. And I think the last doubling time is not the problem, is what this shows. That's what the classic, that's what I was taught the problem was. And I think that is not the problem. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a problem. I think it means the problem is down here in the either getting to the Pluto or getting from the Pluto to the Earth because it's too turbulent. Or perhaps some of these uh, collision issues are going to affect that as well. How much is the, this little pebbles? How much is the radio? How long is the radio migration time versus efficient time? Um, so I have a plot of that. and. Right. So, so in some cases, the uh, in some cases the accretion. So, the, so the ones that are um, that are most effectively accreted, if you can get them, um, and if you have the right relative velocities, are going to be the ones that are drifting fastest through the nebula. Not coincidentally. Um, so, so you can be limited by your accretion rate through the nebula, if that's what you're getting at. Well, but if the you know, migration is much faster than accretion time, then you only catch a tiny fraction. Right, I, but, right, but typically, um, this is what I'm saying, that the ones that are most effectively accreted yeah. are, um, are the ones that are drifting right. the fastest. So that's the, that's the right question to ask. But for these, in this particular example, the drift rate is slower than the accretion rate. You have to ask the question. I mean, the efficiency yeah. of capture, um, I don't remember. But the drift rate is slower than the accretion rate. The efficiency rate. of capture is highest when the stopping time of the particle and the gas is comparable to the amount of time that the capture rate is that way. But that's also the one that drifts so, faster. Well, so no, I don't. Two functions. Okay. One is that's right. at first, if you're inside the Hill radius, everybody's yeah. small tends to fall on. Yeah, I know. But if you're so too if big, you go right past so the. My question is, what's right. calculation? Is the yeah. radio inward drift and the loss from that taken into account? So Yes, but uh, yes, but I'm not limiting. I mean, so I'm limiting the supply that you can get from the by the radial drift rate. But this is, but I, you know, I didn't do a. But I didn't calculate what the efficiency was. So if you want to know how much was caught compared to how much went by, I don't know the answer. Do you know the answer? 
um, actually, for this calculation. I mean, I've done that calculation, but I don't know for this particular uh, one. And that was a Jurassic paper. So um, it's, uh, the, uh, the developers were working on the fine by definition at the particles we start with equal one, which are the, the first epiphytic particles. Sure. So in the initial paper, they, they did not take into, into account the efficiency. Okay. But they did it later. It was in the order of 1%, I think. And the, and the, and the initial... Efficiency of accretion. Oh, of accretion, yes. Yeah. Uh, with, with respect to drifting. Yeah. And this was in the, the 2014 paper. It was taken into account. And it's, it's, it, it's slow what's happening a little bit, but it's still way uh, be, below the, the disk, I think. Yeah, and they did that calculation, but there's, you can't quote one number for that. One of the things that I, one of the, the reasons that I actually think that um, this wasn't appreciated earlier um, is that it's extremely size dependent. I mean, you can't just take a, size, a, a kind of particles and do this. I'm not saying that that's what they did, but, but, uh, but you, you really have to care about the size distribution of your particles. And um, if you've eaten all of one size of particles, you still have some other particles around of different sizes. So it's actually, you, you have to think, you can't quote just one number for so something like that. Like but um, this, this, this one I was just using, equal, this was just as, you know, as an example. You can put in whatever you want. I mean, you, it, it's just the answer that you get depends on your size. And if you go out, and, it went, and this comes back to the question from before, once you're up in these, even above one Earth mass, the range of particle sizes that are accreted very quickly becomes very large. Whereas when you're, when you're smaller, or if you have, um, particularly if you have high turbulent velocities, then it becomes much more sensitive to what size particles you're trying to accrete. And then you have to worry a little bit more about exactly how it's distributed. Yeah, I think that makes an Right, and I don't know what the answer is because you're growing. It's a fragmentation. You're growing and you're fragmenting. You're growing and you're fragmenting. So, so you're going to have things of this size, though, because you see, that directly you see it directly observations. from yeah. observations. And even if you grew bigger, then you'd fragment, even without being in these environments. You're going to so you're going to have. So what fraction of mass you're going to have in these sizes? You know, I don't I don't know, but yeah. Well, there are dust masses, but you don't know what the gas mass is because they derive the gas mass from the dust mass. So you, well, Alma will fix that problem. yes, that's right. So I'm I'm uh, I'm convinced that there are going to be they're seen. There are going to be things in the range that are accretable. But and I and I would be very surprised if any of these issues prevent your last doubling. However, when you go to lower masses, there are going to be issues, and I don't know which one's going to be the most important one, but. Here's, here's one, which is, uh, you know, that was for a smooth disk. If you have a turbulent disk, this is a, a simulation that was done by Zian Zhu, who is an, uh, an undergrad in China, Zhui Ningbai, and um, showing that this works even in, in a turbulent uh, disk. So I've done some, uh, this was a, a, obviously a numerical, uh, no, no, this is in, this is in uh, 3D, and this is actually, this one's with uh, one of Zhui Ning's uh, non-ideal MHD simulations. But we've done it with ideal MHD too, and um, and again, it's size dependent because the turbulence can generate different relative velocities. But at least, um, at least for reasonable parameters, in many cases, uh, it doesn't prevent this from working. All right. So there's still a lot of work there to be done to figure out exactly what the outcome will be. But I at least think that the last doubling time as a conception of that problem is not the right way to think about it anymore. All right, so we come to, um, come back to this uh, plot. And, um, and you know, one of the observational ways of getting at this, I think, as I said before, is to think about whether, um, you know, whether, these, whether these objects are part of the brown dwarf population or whether they're really part of, of the giant planet formation. And, um, and GPI, uh, which I've, um, been involved in, which is why I put that one up there, but also Sphere in Europe um, are, are really looking at just the right part of parameter space to eventually uh, answer this in a, in a statistically um, significant way. And of course, GPI has found, have one planet, uh, 51 Eridani. Stars are they actually going to be able to I forget the number. Hundreds? Yeah. All right. Okay, so again, from an observational perspective, you know, why do you expect these to be just separate distributions? You really don't. I mean, maybe the brown dwarfs look sort of like that on this plot, and maybe the planets look something like that, and they're overlapping. So as we're thinking about other ways of trying to, you know, 
distinguish these populations. And one way is maybe you could just you know, look at this plot and, and think about mass distributions as a function of radius. Um, but another way is to think about um, you know, additional tracers that are independent. So things like stellar metallicity and planet atmospheric composition, which can provide additional constraints. Um, so we've thought about this. I'll just mention it very briefly before going back to, uh, to overall architectures. And, and here's the, the general idea that Karin Oberg and, and Ted Bergen and I thought about, which is that if you have a giant planet that's forming in a disk, this is just the most simplest version, the simple version of this, right? Then beyond um, the water snow line, most of the water in the disk is in solids, where the carbon-bearing species are in gas. So once you're in the outer disk, then all of the volatiles are frozen out together. But in this region, which is where we think most giant planets form, the oxygen is in solids and the carbon is in gas, right? So if you make your core out of solids, you have oxygen there. If you make your envelope out of gas, you have more carbon there. Now, of course, you can throw uh, planetesimals at your envelope and put some oxygen back in. But the fundamental uh, conclusion from this is that if the C to O ratio in the envelopes of giant planets matches the star, that's bizarre. That would be very fine-tuned. So you don't know exactly what the mix is going to be, but it should not be stellar. And that should be particularly true for planets that formed in this region, whereas out at very wide distances, it should be stellar. So that's something that if we see, um, if we can get spectra from enough young giant planets, so young, so they're hot, so you might expect the envelope to actually be mixed to the surface, then you could look for that sort of pattern in the C to O ratio. And that would be another uh, indicator that um, core accretion is actually happening. So of course, there are, um, you know, disk dynamics can really affect this story. So we've been thinking about some of these uh, complications. But that basic uh, idea, I don't think, is going to go away. So let's just look at the top two panels, panels here. Um, this is for the water ice line. This is work from Ana Maria Piso, who is just um, graduating this year. Um, she's a graduate student at Harvard. And here is the initial distance of a planetesimal from a star. And here is the, uh, its final distance, or desorption final distance, where this planetesimal, which is drifting through the nebula, eventually it gets really close to the star, or it doesn't, and it desorbs into the gas, ends up depositing its gas. So you start um, here, these blue lines are small things. If they're out in the gas here, this is a passive disk. They never drift because small things don't drift. They end up where they start. Well, they, if they're really small. If you end up at intermediate sizes, they drift, they drift. This dashed line here is what you would calculate as the snow line. And they drift, and some of them that are good drifters drift past that before they have time to desorb. And then as they get bigger again, up in the red sizes, then again they don't drift. So depending on your particle size distribution, where your ice line is from the perspective of where you put all of that volatile material back into the gas can actually depend on the size of your particle. So over here is the same thing, but for an active disk. And here, since um, the disk is actually accreting inward and all of the small particles are, are uh, attached to that disk gas, then they all get brought in and desorbed at the ice line. So again, these are the sorts of things that you have to worry about when you're trying to figure out what you would actually think that the CEDO ratio in these planet envelopes is, but it shouldn't match the star. And that's something qualitative that we can look for. All right. OK. So given this, um, where are the solar system analogs? And this is just an, an idea, but here are the Here's a clue. This is, comes from work by um, Rebecca Dawson, who is my student at Harvard. And um, she found two things in, uh, that, I'll, that I'll highlight today. And the first one is that, you know, one of the things, the first things that I learned about exoplanets as a graduate student was that there's a pileup of hot Jupiters at three days. Um, it's not clear that that's, I mean, it, it, with Kepler, and here's this, uh, this is Kepler data here on Jupiter mass planets. And this actually has uh, you know, some of the, the false positives they may have heard of about in the Kepler data removed from it already. Um, and this has, uh, you know, you don't see any three-day pileup. So is it real? Well, this is the radial velocity data. And what Becky did. Can I make a comment on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Kepler obviously has a lot of false positives. Right. 
Yeah, so Becky, I checked with Becky, and she said that the Santern false positives were already removed from this. Maybe I'm thinking of a different Santern paper. Sorry? Maybe I'm thinking of a different Santern. No, I, I talked. Becky said she took them out. I'll have to look. I'm not sure what paper you're talking about. All right, I'll ask you afterward. Okay. Well, the point here is actually not the overall distribution. The point here is that if you take out the high metallicity component of this and the low metallicity component, then in the high metallicity component, this is for the stars, you see much stronger evidence for this, this pileup. This is the Kepler data set. Mm -hmm. And these radial velocity stars, they're all high metallicity, almost all. So the point here, and I don't think that it's coming from these false positives, but I'm, I would like to see what you're talking about, just to be sure that I'm up to date, is that um, this pileup, you can see this, and it actually matches the radial velocity result pretty well, but only around the high metallicity stars. And the reason the overall distribution looks different is because the Kepler sample has many more low metallicity stars than the radial velocity sample, because it's looking far away in the disk. Um, it's looking above the plane, so you see some older stars. So there's a very different selection effect, you're saying? There's a very different selection effect. And, um, so the reason that they didn't see so many, I mean, the, so I'm now questioning the Valenti and Fisher result then. Well, they're all looking at high metallicity. Well, th those are. Uh, so there's a mix, because they have some lower. Right, stars. right, sorry. But you can make this plot for the low metallicity stars. There are a few, but it's um, for, the, for the radio velocity sample. But there are so few that it's just. The Poisson noise is too much, you can't so, tell. So are there many more low metallicity stars in the Kepler sample than there are high metallicity stars? Um, there are many, well you can see, at least for... Well, this is with planets. This is with so Jupiters, planets. you have similar numbers. Um, I'm what the actual stars, the 100,000 stars they were looking at. I don't remember, but there are many yeah. more. So we currently don't have a good metallicity sample on the entire Kepler. Uh, stellar sample. People are taking spectra to measure more accurate stellar vectors. So we don't know in the overall, overall sample which lines are bigger. That's, um, that's a very good point. And I should, I should say that these metallicities are from the original Kepler catalog, and these are ratty, ratty metallicities. Um, where we made this cut didn't affect this result. So in making this statement, our statement is that these are meaningful enough that when you take the higher half, they're more metal rich than when you take the lower half. But any individual metallicity here is really bad. And I don't think, that they're, I don't think they're so bad that that right. cut statement is not true. However, um, there's some really nice uh, uh, data being gathered on that will allow much better metallicities, um, particularly there's a group in China uh, that's doing this. Um, and they'll be able to, you know, they'll be able to take all of these, uh, they'll be able to get rid of that uncertainty as well as the false positives and really double check whether this result is valid. So, okay. But I don't think it's gonna go away because this is, this is I mean, I don't see why this shape difference would go away. Well, so people the reason for that is because the low stars tend to have higher false positives because the fact that they have fewer genes than they to start with. So anyway, that's just two Okay, I'll, I'll talk to you afterward. Okay so, um, okay, so the second result that Becky found was that if you look at um, the radial velocity sample and also look at the difference in metallicities, then if you look as a function of distance, um, and here this is one minus e squared, so these are the high metallicity, I mean sorry, the high eccentricity planets and these are the low eccentricities. Then here, um, in between 0.1 and 1 AU, and outside 1 AU is where you have a big uptick in the population of giant planets. Then these high eccentricity Jupiters uh, tend to be around um, high metallicity stars. And this is, you know, you can look at these distributions, and this is statistically significant. 
So we interpret this as being a signature of some sort of planet-planet interaction. The idea being that if you have high metallicity, you're more likely to make more giant planets. You're more likely to have some sort of planet-planet interaction that moves these things um, from their 1AU presumed empirical uh, high density, maybe formation region into this inner region. So here's another way of, of looking at this. Well, before that, here, if, you write, if you actually look at the metallicity distribution um, as a function of, here's eccentricity as a function of mass, um, and do the same metallicity cut. Then at high masses, you tend to have higher eccentricities. This is, again, the radial velocity sample. And again, you can see there that there are more high metallicity stars that are hosting the high mass, high eccentricity planets. So if we put this back up on this plot, which is distance from the star versus planet mass, I showed you this at the beginning. This is the radial velocity sample. Then, um, then here it might be you know, what you might call the giant planet region. I'll just point out that exoplanets.org, if you like to use it, um, explicitly cuts off masses at 24 Jupiter masses, which is that upper line, which really doesn't look like they've allowed for the empirical distribution to fall off of its own accord. So I hope that um, that will be fixed because part of, you know, part of, as I was saying earlier, we'd really like to know where the giant planet population ends and the brown dwarf stellar formation population begins. And you can't see that empirically if you're cutting things off uh, before you see the end of your population. But anyway, if you look out beyond 1AU, you see an uptick in giant planets. And we can, we can make this plot um, as a function of metallicity. So here blue is again high metallicity and red is low metallicity. And look at the difference. And this is really just the same as what I showed you before, but it's another way of looking at it. So here's the high metallicity sample. And here's the low metallicity sample. So let's go back here, right? You have this big population out here, but then it's really filled in. And then if you go to the low metallicity sample, you still have this big population out here but it's not filled in. And in fact, the closer ones tend to be substantially lower mass planets. So if I put them together, then the red and blue points are sitting on top of each other. They're not actually that different in number here. But in here, you're, just, you're looking at these blue points. So the, and it's even more striking in a way than in that other plot because you can see that the low metallicity planets, stars hosting planets in this region actually have lower mass planets. So again, those, that, those planets in that highly eccentric region are the, the higher mass blue ones. All right, so what can we say from this? So, so my hypothesis based on this is that if we want solar system analogs, they should be orbiting the low or at least moderate metallicity stars, not the high metallicity stars that have had these sorts of dynamical histories. So one way to think about this is we could just sort of take a step back and defocus and make two assertions. And I've been thinking about this with Leslie Rogers. The solar system exists. I'm comfortable with that. I'm saying it's not a bizarre statistical fluke. That's an assumption, but it's been uh, proven true throughout history. Um, not proven, but has turned out to be true throughout history. Um, OK, and then the second point here is that you only have a few controlling parameters that determine uh, the diversity of outcomes in your system. You could have stellar mass, disk mass, accretion properties of your disk, which could be affected by the X-ray and UV flux from your star, for example. You could have your stellar environment, whether you have close encounters by nearby stars. I'm sure you could come up with another five things. But that's still way less than the number of knobs we can tune, in theory, to generate populations that, um, uh, you know, of observed planets um, to make them look like whatever we want. OK, so if we do this, um, and I'm just going to show you the simplest example then I, I actually think this is worth thinking about now, even though it's sort of, again, defocused, because it could allow us to make some predictions to just test some of the basic assumptions that I think we all assume without really thinking that much about it. So um, if brown is a solid rocky component, blue is ices, red is gas giants, if I have bars here, it means maybe it's a mixed composition. This means dynamical mixing, so you have different kinds of planets that you're mixed. And what we could say is that, let's say that the thing that matters most is your disk mass. So what would you expect based on that planet formation theory that we started with at the very beginning for formation of the solar system, the one that seemed to not work so well? So well. Um, here's distance from the star, disk mass. This is not supposed to be a, to scale. 
in any way. And this particular plot, though we made others, assumes that type 1 migration doesn't exist. You don't have to assume that. This one does. So one here is the solar system. And we've put this here because it exists. And the idea is that if disk mass is what matters most, right, as you go up in mass, you expect to have more rocks, maybe super Earths here, um, gas giants and ice. If you go even higher in mass, then you have these, this dynamical mixing. And maybe all of the systems that we've seen, or at least most of them from the radial velocity sample, are actually in this little band at the top here. You go down lower in mass. At some point, you can't make gas giants anymore. It could be that in those systems, if you form a, a Neptune or Uranus too late and you can't make a gas giant, it could migrate in by planetesimal driven migration, pick up some solids along the way and form a mini Neptune here. Could be. Go to really low mass systems, you'll just have little rock balls. So what can we do with this? What's the point? Well, first, you know, this doesn't really prove anything at all, but um, we can put some systems on here and it doesn't immediately fail. You can take WASP-47, WASP which has sort of bizarrely mixed planets in the inner region. It has a high metallicity. Um, put some other systems on here from Kepler. Uh, and you, know, you take, this one has some, some little rock balls. It has a low metallicity. It doesn't immediately fail. So what can we do with things like this? And this is just, again, one of the simplest examples. We can say, well, if disk mass is the controlling parameter, and I think we often just assume that how much mass you have matters a lot, um, then if you see a super Earth here, you should see giant planets out there. Right? So if you see a super Earth here, um, and if you see a mini Neptune here in this case, there should be no giants out here. Okay. So what you could do is you could say, if we have a sample that has super Earths or mini Neptunes, and a sample that doesn't of stars, can we look to see if there's a difference in the radial velocity trend statistics in those systems? You don't even necessarily need to wait long enough to find all of the giant planets at large distances if you're doing a binary comparison to look for radial velocity trends. And um, you know, this hasn't been done yet. Um, right, so disk mass could depend on a number of things. Um, one thing that might be a good proxy or might not is metallicity. And that's at least measurable in the star. Stellar, Stellar metallicity. So, disc, so that would be solid disk mass. And it would be assuming that, that um, the metallicity is more important than the range of total masses, which may or may not be true. But at least it's something to try. So you can look at, you could look at whether the, uh, you could separately, you could look at whether systems with super Earths are more or less likely to have radial velocity trends. And you could also look to see whether stellar metallicity was a good predictor of that. Those are two separate questions. Yeah. yeah. Metallicity, I mean, I actually, my 0.18, that's 0.18 what the law of 10, right? Mm -hmm. So what is that? That's back to 1.5 or something like that in, in metallicity? Well, I see where you're going. However, let's refer back to the Fisher and Valenti plot that showed a dramatic difference. So, um, so you may say, well, that shouldn't matter at all. But we know that it at least matters for something. Well, well, well no, 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 no. It's an interesting question of principle, right? Right. I mean, it, it, it indicates that the time information processing isn't some parts of the chain of events that it comprises a close run thing. So um, let me also say that uh, sort of along the lines of what you're talking about, people often talk about ice lines mattering. And that's only a factor of two or three in solid density that you can get at the ice line. So either that means the ice line doesn't matter, or it supports your statement that, it actually, that it's actually fairly sensitive to density. I'm actually sort of on the I don't think ice lines matter that much side, but, but it doesn't. Sure, yeah, that's right. Um, but I hear what you're saying, but, this, but, I, but again, the Fisher and Valenti result, which has been robust over time, shows that it does matter. And the question is, well, no why and how? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. What, what precisely in the whole process is so sensitive to the metallicity? Exactly, yes. 
And, um, and I think that it's worth really investigating that because I think often we assume it is the disk mass. And that's actually why we made this plot. It's not that I necessarily think this is going to be right. I think that if you assume that it's just the solid density as produced by different metallicities, and that's what's telling, then, um, then you should get something like this. I mean, maybe you'd make your own version. It would be a little different from ours. But you should be able to make some of these predictions. They should turn out to be right. And if they're not, then, then I think we need to really think much more carefully about the kind of question that you're asking. All right, OK. So, um, all right, so I think I'll end here because I'm out of time. So, uh, so I asked at the beginning, under what circumstances does giant planet formation permit Earth-like histories for terrestrial planets? And the hypothesis that I just said is that the solar system's architecture reflects formation around a low to moderate metallicity star. Right? So the idea here is that if you're high metallicity or high mass, you have um, dynamical upheaval. If you're low metallicity or low mass, you don't make giant planets at all. If you're in the middle, you make the solar system. So then is the solar system common? Well, the question then becomes, how much, how much phase space is there in the middle here? How much phase space is there for making giant planets but not causing a big disaster? I don't know. I mean, we'll have to answer that empirically, presumably. But that's at least a way of conceptualizing that answer to that question. All right. Thank you. Well, um, you know what? We I agree with you that there was there's clear evidence for motion in our solar system. Whether or not the grand tack is exactly what happened or not, um, you know our planets clearly moved around to some extent. It's so another way of saying that is, does that mean that it was a near disaster? It's not obvious to me that it does actually. Maybe, but maybe it does. So maybe that means maybe the space space is actually really tiny. But maybe you can move around a little, and and uh, and, you, and you really need more than two very giant planets to end up having a, a, a serious problem. Well, that's that's that model certainly. Going on about in situ versus migration, or is there right. something? Yep. So we see this big diversity of architecture. Right. And surely, isn't that by itself an, an important clue? Because the extent to which you rely on a systematic evolution of very small things, yeah. you know, either, maybe your 10 centimeter things, or maybe sure. the size of the end, or what, you know, something very small, yeah. it makes it harder to avoid a, a convergent behavior. Yep. Uh, between different planetary systems, right? The more you depend on large objects, the more obviously the stochasticity or you know, sensitivity to initial conditions there. Yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with you, but I would say that you know it's worth remembering that. I mean, of course you know, but it's worth remembering that the uh, you know the kinds of systems that we can see are still extremely selection biased. So you know, one of the things we that one of the major thinking changes that's happened, and I think is very appropriate from the discovery of exoplanets, is to realize that our solar system is not archetypal, uh, archetypical, archetypical, right? But um, I also think there's some value in going back to those sort of basic ideas that came out of the formation of the solar system and asking how much is it actually necessary to change them in order to see the kind of diversity of systems that we see. And that was part of the motivation for making this plot. Because this plot, in particular, without type 1 and nothing, I mean, like, this is just, this is just taking that old, that old solar system formation model and scaling it up and down, in a way. And you can actually get a lot of what we see and put it on the plot, which, again, doesn't prove anything, but it's not immediately ruled out. So I think it's worth keeping that in mind. Um, I don't disagree about 
your conclusion about the physics, uh, you know, of small bodies. But um, but I think it's it's worth sort of thinking from both ends and trying to in, trying to be conservative from both ends before being too wor to I don't know I don't know exactly what word I want to use, but yeah, it's not obvious to me that it's a problem. Other questions? All right, so uh, we had a search for cookies. We had dinner last night, so no dinner. Uh, and Ruth is around through most of tomorrow, and there are still slots open, but so we don't want to talk to Ruth directly anymore. Okay, let's thank Ruth again.